Today on America's Test Kitchen, Keith makes Bridget the ultimate chicken piccata. Dan explores the science of temperature perception. And Bridget and Julia reveal the steps to a show-stopping chocolate semi-fredo. It's all coming up right here on America's Test Kitchen. In essence, chicken piccata is simply chicken that's dredged in flour, cooked, and then served with a bright lemony caper sauce. It's a very simple recipe, and that's where things can go wrong quickly. But luckily, Keith's here, and he's going to show us how to make piccata the right way. Yeah, with simple recipes, there's no place to hide imperfections and flaws. So we're really going to start right from the bottom here and make the perfect piccata. And that's going to start with our chicken breasts. Okay. We have a really great way of making cutlets. What we do is we cut it in half vertically like this, and you take that thin piece off, and that's one cutlet. And now you can take the thicker cutlet and cut that in half horizontally. So now we have three evenly sized, evenly thick cutlets. So we're just to make sure that these are perfectly even, we're just gonna do a quick pounding to a half inch. You wanna let the meat pounder do the work here. Right. You don't wanna smash it. Okay, those are perfectly a half an inch. I measured it with my eye. <laughs> So another problem that we have with chicken breasts is that they are lean and really bland. Yes. So what we're gonna do is we're gonna put this in here with the remainder of our cutlets and we're working with four six to eight ounce chicken breasts today. Okay. Before we go into cooking these, we're gonna season them with two teaspoons of kosher salt. And that's gonna season the chicken breasts throughout and help them stay moist when we cook them later on. And I'm also gonna season with our pepper right now too. We have a half teaspoon of pepper. And what the salt is doing is it's changing the structure of the protein in the chicken. Right now, the protein strands are all going in one direction, but the salt is gonna change things up a little bit and create more of a web. So it's gonna hold on to moisture better. Okay, it's been 15 minutes and the salt has done its magic with the chicken breast. It's gonna be super moist when we cook it. But first, we're gonna dredge this in a little bit of flour. This is a traditional method for most chicken piccata. And the flour is gonna help protect this chicken when it's in the skillet. And it's gonna help it brown too in the skillet. We're only gonna be in the skillet for a matter of two or three minutes. So it really does need to brown quickly. So we just want a really, really light coating here. We don't want a heavy coating of flour. So I put it in the flour, toss it around, and then you can just pat the, any excess flour off. And it's a step that you don't want to skip. If you were to leave these cutlets unfloured, not only would they take longer to brown, but really those edges just get leathery and dry. Now we have a 12 inch skillet over there with two tablespoons of vegetable oil over medium high heat. I can see little wisps of smoke coming off there and I yep. think it's time to cook half of our chicken breast. We're gonna do this in two batches. So I'll just lay that in there. You always want to lay chicken cutlets in the pan away from you, not towards you. Hot oil on your feet or on your hands is not <laughs> fun. Okay, so that's in there. We've got a lot of nice space around there. Those are gonna cook really quickly. So two to three minutes for that side and then we'll flip it over and go another two to three minutes until they're nice golden right. brown. While those are cooking, we're gonna focus on the lemon in our sauce. A lot of recipes just use straight lemon juice which is really, really boring. It's just bright and that's all you get. You have no complexity. But today we're actually gonna use the whole lemon. So I'm gonna take half of this. I'm gonna cut it this way in half. Now, what we're providing here is that we have the zest, of course. That's what makes lemons smell really good of those aromatic compounds in the zest. We also have the juice, which is gonna be citric acid, which is gonna provide us a lot of tanginess. But what we really liked was the pith, this white part right here. And normally we don't want that because it's a little bit bitter, but that's gonna be actually perfect for our piccata. It's gonna give us a really well-rounded flavor and it's gonna balance out the citric acid and the aromatics from that zest. And I'm just gonna thinly slice this these whole slices are gonna go into our sauce. I'm just gonna put that in our bowl here. Okay, so let's go check on our chicken and see how this is going. Oh yeah, nicely brown, yeah. golden. Oh, that's good color. So we're just gonna cook the second side, two to three minutes. We'll take those out. We'll heat another two tablespoons of vegetable oil and cook our second batch. Okay, so our second batch of chicken is done. We've uh, cooked this in two tablespoons of vegetable oil for two to three minutes aside. Beautifully browned. And now we can start building our sauce. And we have some lovely fond in our skillet that we're gonna use to flavor our sauce. So I have a teaspoon of vegetable oil and I have one minced shallot. This is gonna 
give our sauce a nice aromatic backbone. I'm just gonna cook this until it's softened. I wanna make sure that I'm getting up all those little brown bits. Okay, our shallots are softened, and I just have one last addition for aromatics. I have a clove of garlic, and now I have a cup of chicken broth. And that last addition will help to get any fawn that we have on the bottom. I have three tablespoons of fresh lemon juice. Now, our lemon slices that we cut up earlier. And that's going to extract all those flavors from the pith, the zest, and from the juice inside. Okay, this is at a simmer. And now, most chicken piccata recipes would stop here, but we're gonna do something a little different. We're gonna put our cutlets back into our sauce. Now, what's gonna happen is that that flour on the chicken is gonna thicken our sauce, but also the sauce is gonna kind of rinse off any excess flour from the chicken cutlets so it's not gummy. So we're gonna have kind of a perfect harmony between the two. Now, that's a huge deviation from the classic. Usually, you cook the chicken cutlets all the way through. You put them to the side. They're getting cold while the sauce is being made. Then you add the sauce, you pour it over the chicken, and you hope for the best. Yeah. So now, we're just gonna let this simmer in here really gently. It's okay if we cook the cutlets in here a little bit longer. They've already probably been cooked through in that initial sear, but that salt will make sure that the cutlets stay nice and juicy. Okay, it's been four minutes, and you can see that the sauce is nicely thickened, well-coated, and so we're just gonna transfer the cutlets to a platter, and we can finish our sauce. Okay, so our sauce should be about the texture of heavy cream. I think that's probably perfect. A nice, thick consistency. That flour has done its job and thickened our sauce. Beautiful. And I'm just gonna turn the heat off, and I'm going to whisk in three tablespoons of butter off the heat so it doesn't break. We wanna make sure that emulsifies the sauce. And that butter is just gonna add richness to the sauce. We have a lot of bright flavors from the lemon. We wanna temper that with a little bit of whole butter. Okay, so our three tablespoons of unsalted butter has melted and emulsified in there nicely. We have a nice, smooth, rich sauce. And now, for my favorite part, two tablespoons of capers. The capers are gonna add a nice briny hit to the sauce, and one tablespoon of chopped parsley. Parsley is just gonna brighten it up and add a little bit of freshness. So I'm gonna stir this in. Just wanna give it a quick taste. I'm gonna add just a touch of salt to this. Stir that in. I think we are good to go. Yeah, now I'm good. just gonna take this, now we'll spoon it over our chicken cutlets. I'm really glad to see that you did not strain out those lemon pieces. No, that's the star of this sauce. We don't wanna take those out. Okay, I'm gonna give you two cutlets. And you can see how those lemon slices have broken down and given up all their flavor to this sauce. It's gonna be really, really great. A little extra sauce for our plates. We don't wanna skimp on the sauce here. I'm gonna say something I never say about boneless, skinless chicken breast cutlets. Juicy. And moist. And tender. Yeah. It's not dried out. Yeah, and when you get a bite of that lemon slice, it's perfect. You have the bright hit of acidity, but you also have a little bit of balance in there with the bitterness from the pith. This is absolute excellence, Keith. Perfection yeah. and piccata. Perfection and piccata, perfect, <laughs> Keith. Well, if you'd like perfection and piccata at home, cut and pound chicken breasts, sprinkle with salt and pepper, and let the seasoning penetrate the meat. Dredge in flour, cook until brown, then make a sauce with shallot and both lemon juice and slices. Return the cutlets to the pan to cook through, then finish the sauce with butter, capers, and parsley. So from our test kitchen to your kitchen, the easy, elegant, and now foolproof chicken piccata. Today, I'm elbow deep in a very cold experiment. My right hand is submerged in a bucket full of ice cubes. My left hand is submerged in a bucket full of frozen butter cubes. Now, they all came out of the same freezer, and they're actually at the exact same temperature, but they sure don't feel that way. You can see that my right hand is bright red. Now, that's an indicator that it's pretty cold, but let's switch to the thermal camera to get the full picture. As you can see, my right hand is significantly colder than my left. But how is that? Because water has a much higher thermal capacity than fat does, which means, given the same amount of material, at the same temperature, the water can hold a lot more energy. So, a cube of frozen water can pull a lot more heat out of its environment than a cube of frozen fat. This actually matters a lot when it comes to frozen desserts, like semi-fredo and ice cream. If your recipe is too much fat, like this bucket of butter cubes, it won't feel cold enough to be refreshing. 
But if it contains too little, all that frozen water will be icy cold like a popsicle, or this bucket of ice cubes. So for a frozen dessert that is both refreshing and rich, you have to strike just the right balance. Today, we're making semifredo, which is an Italian frozen dessert, like ice cream or frozen custard, except that the whites or the cream are whipped before being incorporated, so it has a lighter, softer consistency. And instead of being scooped and served either in a cone or a bowl, semifredo is formed into a loaf and served by the slice, making it perfect for a dinner party. And Bridget's gonna show us how it's made. We're making a beautiful semifredo. I love it because it's puffy, it's airy, it's luxurious. But what we love about it is actually after you take it out of the freezer, it doesn't melt too quickly. It's, as you said, it's perfect for a dinner party. And guess what? We're gonna make a chocolate one because we like chocolate. I do like chocolate. <laughs> It's so easy. So we're starting with a custard base. We need to heat up a little bit of dairy. Now we're using a half a cup of heavy cream. We tried versions that were made with milk instead of heavy cream, but we found them too light. <laughs> they were also too hard and they actually felt really cold like ice milk, but it was so strange because it was the same temperature as the ones made with heavy cream. And of course, you know that water was transferring that cold, cold feeling onto our tongues, and we just got downright cold. <laughs> so we're using heavy cream, but not all heavy cream. Again, this is a half cup. We're gonna temper it with a little bit of water, a quarter cup of water there. So it just has the perfect amount of fat. Exactly. All right, so now let's go ahead and turn this to medium heat. We're gonna bring this up to a simmer. In the meantime, we can get a few other ingredients ready. Half a teaspoon of espresso powder and a tablespoon of vanilla extract. We'll just stir these two together until the espresso powder is dissolved. Now, adding instant espresso powder is something we often do when making chocolate desserts because it just gives that chocolate a heartier flavor. All right, so that's enough of that. Now, the egg part of our custard. So it's three whole eggs. I also have five tablespoons of granulated sugar and a little bit of salt. This is a quarter teaspoon of table salt. I'll whisk this together, just break up those eggs until it's fully combined. All right, so now that this is combined, we wanna start adding this dairy to our eggs, but we wanna do it gradually, tempering the egg yolks, bringing their temperature up so that they don't scramble. I'm gonna add a little bit of our cream and water mixture, just slowly, a little drizzling, and then once it starts to come together, you can be a little bit more aggressive with it. So this egg mixture is gonna go right back into that saucepan. All right, now I'm going to turn it to medium low. We're gonna cook this stirring the bottom and the sides constantly. I don't want the eggs to start to set. We're gonna do it as gently as we can until the temperature reaches between 160 and 165. And that's gonna take about five minutes. Let's check this temperature again. We're looking for between 160 and 165, and that is looking good. So we want to get this off of the heat. Right, because if you let it cook too long, those eggs will scramble, and you don't want that. You do not want this. And now, for the chocolate, we're going to pour this into a fine mesh strainer, set Ooh. over eight ounces of bittersweet chopped chocolate. Now, we did it over a fine mesh strainer because you can see some of those egg solids in there, and mm -hmm. we did not want that going into our semifredo. <laughs> All right, so it's been five minutes, the chocolate's softened. Just whisking this together. Now, you really don't want to use chips for a recipe like this. As I mentioned before, it was bar chocolate because chips contain emulsifiers and thickeners to help them keep their shape. All right, that looks beautiful, nice, oh, and does. smooth, gorgeous. Mm -hmm. So now we're gonna add the espresso mixture in there, that little bit of vanilla as well. That looks beautiful, but this mixture is still a little bit warm, so we wanna let it cool completely, about 15 minutes before we move on to our next step. All right, so our mixture's cooled down. It's been about 15 minutes. Now we can turn this into a semifredo, <laughs> what is now a chocolate custard. will be a puffy light dessert. Bring it. All right, so we need to whip something and fold it into this. I've got one and a half cups more of that heavy cream, and this is very, very cold. Always great when you whip cream, make sure it's super cold. So I'm gonna start it on low for 30 seconds, and then move it up to medium for another 30 seconds. All right, so now I'm gonna turn it up to high, and we're gonna let it go until it forms soft peaks. That's another 30 to 45 seconds. All right, that should be it. Now, we don't want stiff peaks. It's going to be too difficult to incorporate them into this thick mixture. So let me get this off of here. All right, and I'm gonna give it a little bit of a whisk a couple of times with this beater just to see what it's looking like. And you see it's a nice soft Ooh. peak, just like that. Perfect. Perfect. All right. 
So now we need to incorporate this into our chocolate custard. We don't want to just drop it all in because we'll deflate much of the whipped cream. So I'm going to take about a third of it and we'll add that. So you can see how thick this chocolate mixture is when it cools. And we're just using a whisk. All right, at this point, we don't need to worry about incorporating all of the whipped cream. They can be a little streaky. Now that first third is in there, I can add the rest of the cream. We're basically making a mousse. So I'm going to go to my rubber spatula and start to fold in. I'll take my time. Really, I'm just cutting through the center and then scraping the bowl. At this point, we do not want to see any streaks of cream left in here. All right, so that's looking pretty good. I don't see any more whipped cream in there, streaks. So now we are ready to put this into our mold. We are using a loaf pan. This is about eight and a half by four and a half inches. I greased the bottom of this, lined it with some plastic wrap. It's gonna be so much easier to get this out. <laughs> Otherwise, you remember the old days where you'd be dipping it in hot water to uh, try to loosen that semi fredo mm -hmm. and they'd pull it out and be saucy <laughs> everywhere. All right, so let me just go ahead and pour this into our mold. All right, that looks absolutely gorgeous. Good enough to eat. So now I'm gonna cover the top with some of that plastic that's hanging over the sides of the pan. You don't have to be too neat about this. Because that's gonna be the bottom. That's the bottom, but you do want it to be flat. Now I'm gonna go ahead and put this into the freezer. It's gotta be in there for at least six hours until it firms up. Now, as Bridget said, semi-fredo doesn't melt as quickly as ice cream, making it perfect for a dessert for company. Now, why is that? As ice cream sits, heat from the room hits the outside of the ice cream and passes straight into it without much resistance, melting it. Semi-fredo has a secret heat-proofing ingredient, air. Ice cream contains some air, but when we whip cream, we add lots of air. And by folding that frothy whipped cream into our semi-fredo, we essentially create an ice cream that's pumped full of air, and air is a great insulator. So when the dinner party gets good and hot, the heat can't get inside the dessert as easily because of all that insulation. So it takes much longer for the semi-fredo to melt. And that's why semi-fredo stays frozen longer and retains its shape better than ice cream. So we're gonna make something that goes alongside a beautiful chocolate semifredo, a cherry sauce. Mm. So easy to make, chocolate and cherries, perfect. So this is 12 ounces of frozen sweet cherries. Obviously they're pitted. And we're using frozen here because we're gonna turn them into a sauce, right? Nice and easy. Exactly. Now I'm going to add a little bit of sugar. This is a quarter cup of granulated sugar. And I'll toss these together just to coat. So these are still frozen at this point. They are, they're fruit sickles. <laughs> So that's good enough. So now I'm going to put this into the microwave. We're gonna cook it on high power for about one and a half minutes. After that, I'll stir it and cook it another minute. What we're doing is we're really just getting that sugar to dissolve and those juices to start being pulled out of the cherries. All right, so here's Ooh, our cherries. Juicy. Give them a final stir there. Just get any of the sugar that wasn't dissolved because it was clinging against the side of the bowl. All right, so now, if you wouldn't mind holding that fine mesh strainer of the saucepan. You got it, and I'm gonna stand back because that is cherry juice, also Here. known as a shirt killer. <laughs> I'm gonna pour this through the fine mesh strainer into our saucepan. Give it a shake here. We're separating the juices from the solids in there because we wanna retain their shape, but we want to reduce this liquid down and just actually thicken it a little bit so that it clings to our semi fredo Makes sense. So I'm gonna turn the burner to medium high. There we go, we're gonna bring this up to a simmer. In the meantime, let's talk about thickener. Now we're making a cornstarch slurry so that we can add it to our liquid and it'll just thicken it up just like that. I've got one and a half teaspoons of cornstarch. I'm gonna add two tablespoons of liquid. Now you could use water to do this, but why would you when they make something called kirsch? <laughs> <laughs> a beautiful cherry brandy. Again, if you want to use water, that's fine. Ooh, that's gonna be good. Mm -hmm. Just adding another cherry dimension. We're just going to stir this until the cornstarch is completely dissolved. And now we don't wanna add it to our mixture until it's up to a full boil. Really cornstarch needs that boiling liquid in order to expand and thicken. So now we got our boiling liquid. I'll pour in our slurry and stir it just really one to two minutes tops until it's nice and thick. There it goes. There it goes. Oh, nice and glossy. All right, so that's nice and jammy mm -hmm. and thick. Mm. Oh, yes, Gorgeous. beautiful. And that's the thing about cornstarch, it makes a glossy sauce. But if you cook it too long, it'll actually burst and stop thickening. So I'm gonna take it off heat, scooch right over here, and now we can add our cherry solids back into that pot, just really warming it through, softening oh. them just a wee bit. 
And then to brighten it up a little bit, one tablespoon of freshly squeezed lemon juice. That on chocolate's gonna be amazing. And now we're gonna leave this here in the saucepan. You can transfer it to a bowl now or you can let it cool completely. And this can actually be made up to a week in advance, stored in the fridge. And we'll wait for the semifredo to completely firm up. All right, Julia, your mm. guests are here. <laughs> so I'm going to unfold the plastic. It's completely firmed up. Let's invert a platter over it. And then, whoop. All right. So now we lift that away. <laughs> I've never seen one come off so easily before. You know, if it doesn't come off easily the first time, just let it sit for a couple of seconds, warm it with your hands, and it'll release. Remove that beautiful mm. plastic, it did its job. If there are any spots that aren't very smooth, you can always dip your spatula mm. into hot water, wipe it off on a towel, and it's just really the residual heat. It's kind of remelting that, turning it into a nice, smooth surface. Now, one thing you should notice, as I've been cleaning this up, it's not melting. No, it's not. Yes, we don't have a chocolate creme anglaise here <laughs> on our hands. It still is in a beautiful low form. Love it. <laughs> so now it's time to slice it and serve. And we want pretty thick slices, Good. so about three quarter inch. Right through. All right, and I wanna dip my knife in, in between each cut, wipe it off on a towel to get rid of any excess water. Mm. Look at that, gorgeous. All right, I'm gonna put that on a plate here. Oh, lovely. Some cherry sauce. Mm hmm Don't skimp. And some of the juices as well. Oh, yeah. Some candied nuts. These are Ooh. slivered almonds, toasted and candied. Mm. Very easy. And you can get that recipe on our website, americastestkitchen.com. All right. All right. Proof is in the tasting. Now, this is so soft. So good. The flavor of the chocolate, and it's a strong, bittersweet chocolate flavor. Mm. The cherry and the almond. Ugh. Oh. It has that rich ice cream-like flavor, but the texture is just much lighter, a little more elegant. More like a mousseline. Delicious. So if you want to make a chocolate semi-fredo, start with a simple chocolate custard using eggs, heavy cream, and bittersweet chocolate. Whip heavy cream, then fold it into the cooled chocolate custard and spread into a loaf pan lined with plastic wrap and freeze. To serve, slice the semi-fredo and garnish with a quick cherry sauce and some candied almonds. From America's Test Kitchen to your kitchen, a great recipe for chocolate semi-fredo. You can get this recipe and all the recipes from this season, along with our tastings, testings, and selected episodes at our website, americastestkitchen.com. Still not melted. Still not melted. I love this. It's still fully fredo, not <laughs> semi-fredo. <laughs> Thanks for watching America's Test Kitchen. What'd you think? Well, leave a comment and let us know which recipes you're excited to make, or you can just say hello. You can find links to today's recipes and reviews in the video description. And don't forget to subscribe to our channel. See you later. I'll see you later.